comments. Um, today, we are on the 50th anniversary of a march that took place in Washington, and Brewster will say a little more about that later. But it was part of a tumultuous four-month period that was set in motion by the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia by Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Uh, none of us could imagine 50 years later that we would be in the midst of a national crisis that affected every one of us. And it's already mm -hmm. taken in two months, 20,000 more American lives than the Vietnam War did in 15 years. We could not have imagined that 50 years later, the US and Vietnam would have warm diplomatic and political relations. Hey, Peter. Uh, that the US would be the largest market for Vietnamese exports and the second largest source of tourists. And that Vietnamese would be the sixth largest cohort of foreign students in the US, more than 24,000. Nor that the biggest threat to Vietnamese sovereignty and security would be China, which has asserted military control over most of the South China Sea. So it's a reasonable question to ask why we have come together today to recall and honor the national student strike, students who died at Kent State and Jackson State, and the marchers killed at the Chicano Moratorium. I'm gonna to turn to the words of a founder of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, the late Tom Hayden, which I think sets the context. Quoting Tom from his book, the 1965 to 75 peace movement reached a scale that threatened the foundations of the American social order, making it both an inspirational model for future social movements and a nightmarish narrative that our governing elites have tried to wipe from collective memory ever since. Those who oppose the war are needed now more than ever, now and tomorrow, to prevent the dimming of memory and to keep history from repeating. So that's what brings us here today. Uh, we're gonna start out talking about the National Student Moratorium, which has disappeared from almost everyone's memory uh, and most scholarly research. Amanda Miller uh, will explain the project that she did with the University of Washington when she was an undergraduate there, Amanda. And people, let me just say for uh, two uh, procedural things that I should have said. One is that if you have questions, uh, at the bottom of your screen, it says Q&A. You click on that, you can write a question, you can direct it to a particular panelist, um, or if you don't, then Terry Province <laughs> will be monitoring the questions. We'll try and figure out who it's most appropriate to. He will also merge questions that are overlapping. Um, this is just written questions, but a week from today, uh, we plan a, another webinar, which will be in a, in a Zoom room and it'll be wide open for participation. So, sorry, Amanda, please go okay. ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna be giving a brief overview of the May 1970 student strike and then also um, show the maps that I worked on um, when I was a student at University of Washington with Professor James Gregory, I'm sort of mapping the student strike. And I'm gonna send in the chat um, a link to those maps so that people can um, look at them while I'm speaking and then I'll share my screen a little bit later. Okay. Um, let me say for people not familiar with the system that if you click on speaker view at the upper right, you will get a bigger picture of Amanda or whoever's speaking at the time and what they're showing you. All right. Um, so I worked with Professor Gregory on a number of maps um, about the anti-war movement, um, but the most comprehensive by far is of the May 1970 student strike, which is why I'm really excited to be speaking here today. Um, the data for these maps is mostly from um, information bulletins putting out put out by a group called the National Strike Information Center um, throughout spring of 1970 that would listed campus on strikes, clarified strike demands, and highlighted important news 
um, and mailed to news organizations and campuses. Um, this was operated by Brandeis students who volunteered to make their campus the strike headquarters um, and was really you know, powered just by student volunteers. So um, just a huge thank you to those students who um, have made preserving the memory of the student strike possible and to the various archives we were able to get those from. Um, so for the brief overview of the strike, it was sp uh, most directly sparked um, by a televised address uh, made by President Nixon on April 30th, 1970, in which he announced that US military units had entered Cambodia in an effort to disrupt North, America, uh, North Vietnamese supply lines. And for many people, this really felt like a betrayal a betrayal of Nixon's campaign promise to begin the process of Vietnamization or uh, the withdrawal of US, US troops from Vietnam. Um, and to many people indicated that the war in Southeast Asia was expanding rather than ending. Um, so the next day students across the country started protesting on college campuses and the original plans for the strike were laid um, by a group of student activists from East Coast schools who were gathered at Yale to protest the bombing of Cambodia and the trial of Black Party of uh, Black Panther member Bobby Seale. Um, we actually have someone on the panel who was there, so he'll speak more about that. Um, and what followed was a nationwide outburst of student unrest that was in a lot of ways the peak of the student anti-war movement. Um, there was walkouts um, that we have found record of on nearly 900 campuses, and we found evidence of activity in every state but Alaska. Uh, over 100 campuses were closed for at least one day, and many schools' final exams were canceled or made optional, and ROTC programs were eliminated, and 21 campuses um, were shut down for the remainder of the school year. And something that I think is really um, unique and interesting about the student strike is that for all its national scope and scale, with you know 900 schools participating, it was really localized and spontaneous in nature, where strikes, actions, and events were organized and carried out. Um, by individuals on a campus by campus basis without the support of any major um, national civil rights or anti-war organizations and was able to spread, you know, within days of the event that sparked it. In just one week, uh, the strike had spread from New England where it was uh, sort of dreamed up to hundreds of campuses across the country. Um, and the speed that it spread can really be attributed to two main things. Um, students' frustration with the endless war in Southeast Asia and their anger over the shootings at Kent State and at Jackson State. Um, so we're gonna have panelists who are gonna speak a lot in a lot more depth about those uh, two events, but just for a brief overview, on May 4th, the Ohio National Guard was called onto Kent State University's campus and opened fire on a crowd of protesting students, killing four and wounding nine. Um, and the shock and rage over this is a major reason why the strike was able to spread as, to as many campuses as it did, because it made the strike really personal for a lot of students. And you can see this in that the biggest spike in reported strikes and actions was on May 5th, which would be the day after Kent State. And then on May 14th, um, National Guard troops uh, opened fire on students protesting the war, and particularly the disproportionate number of Black men dying in the war and racism in Jackson at Jackson State. Um, two people were killed and 11 were injured. Unfortunately, uh, this didn't really spark the same spike in protests as the Kent State shooting did, um, but locally, uh, you can see in the maps that there were several schools in Mississippi that had protests related to that. Um, so it was also a really important thing in spreading the strike. Um, and it's really good that we're here to commemorate um, both of those events, as well as the Chicano Moratorium, which was later. Um, so the National Strike Information Center was also a crucial factor in spreading the student strike um, because they were able to circulate, circulate news about the strike in a time when communication with campus, between campuses would have been very difficult and expensive um, and helped to sustain a sense of solidarity, solidarity and remind participants that each campus was part of a you know, larger movement of unprecedented dimensions um, and to you know, keep the strike focused and uh, clarify the goals. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go over the goals that are um, given in the newsletters that our uh, database is uh, largely based on. Um, the first goal is that the United States government end its systematic repression of political dissidents and release all political prisoners, such as Bobby Seale and other members of the Black Panther Party. Um, so that goal really connects imperialism and racism abroad to racism at home and shows that, you know, the student strike was not just about 
uh, the war or just about Kent State, but had like a broader um, radical ideology. Um, the second goal is that the United States government uh, sees exp its expansion of the Vietnam War into Laos and Cambodia, that it unilaterally and immediately withdraw all forces from Southeast Asia. This is the best known goal, probably a priority for most striking students. And then the third goal is that the universities and their complicity with the U.S. war machine by an immediate end to defense research, ROTC, counterinsurgency research, and all other such programs. Um, so this is directly tied to the university campus as a site for change. This is the thing that students had the most control over, which is why you see so many um, occupations of ROTC buildings and offices, um, because this is the arm of the military industrial complex that students were faced with on a daily basis. And so these three demands together reflect a really multifaceted critique of the United States as an imperialist and racist power. But it's not uh, completely clear what percentage of striking students actually shared all of these demands, especially, you know, there were so many schools that participated that have very little history of radical activism. Many people were just angry about the war and about Kent State. Um, and there's not much mention of racial justice in reports from other campuses. But for some students, definitely that was a major concern. Um, and motivations for participating in the strike were ultimately as diverse as the students themselves. Um, and taken together, these issues can really paint a picture of the political and social climate of 1970 that made um, an event like this possible. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen so I can show the maps. Can everyone see? Oh, no. There we go. Okay, so this is the map of the sort of all of the actions um, that took place in May of 1970. Um, you can see every single state in the continental US and in Hawaii, it's over there, so I'm not gonna show it, um, was impacted, including states you know, in the South and in the Plains states, um, which really speaks to the importance of this singular moment for campus activism. Um, and when you look at this map, it is really important to remember the diversity of what it could mean for a school to be on strike or have strike related activity. So green ones just means there was a protest of some kind. Red means some kind of boycott of classes. And then the blue indicates where schools were closed either for a day or for the remainder of the year. And um, so you can see that the densest clusters are here on the mid-Atlantic and in New England, um, and then through the Midwest and in California, um, which in some ways just reflects density of universities, um, but also suggests where the support for the strike was the strongest. You can see obviously quite a few actions in Ohio, um, which is you know, probably in large part related to um, sort of local outrage over Kent State. And as you mouse over, you can get descriptions of what happened um, at these various different campuses. Um, Four-year colleges and universities um, definitely accounted for the most um, institutions affected by the strike, but we also have uh, several, uh, 106 two-year colleges and 135 high schools. And so on this one, you can filter and see where um, community colleges were most affected and um, where high schools were most affected. And you can see there's really this extremely dense cluster of high schools being organized in um, New York and uh, Western Massachusetts, which I think um, indicates that the college students there were doing some really um, intense organizing work uh, to go out to these high schools and get them involved. Um, and so just because the densest areas are of uh, student activism are in these like traditional strongholds of new left activism um, doesn't mean that these were the only places impacted. And really one of the most intriguing features of the strike um, was the participation of liberal to moderate students at moderate to conservative campuses in moderate to conservative states. You know, we have lots of actions in Kansas, in Oklahoma, um, in states that you don't really think about when you think about um, necessarily anti-war activism or um, the new left. Um, so I think that that's one of the coolest things about um, what this map shows. Um, and this really challenges the idea that student activism 
uh, anti-war activism was isolated and it had existed only in the bubble of the hyper hyper progressive college campus and is really a, a testament to the impact of the strike and um, I think I hope everyone goes and looks at these maps and I think one of if I would like people to use it for one things one thing it's to you know have a look at where you were in 1970 or where you live now you can filter you know state by state and see those local actions that happened and um, really preserve the memory of those you know for a lot of them all we have is just on strike um, or strike activity reported and if you know people could use this as a tool to reach out to those places and um, keep those histories alive i think that would be really wonderful um in you know commemorating the memory of this and uh, bringing people, uh, you know, bring it back into public memory so that it's not forgotten. Um, and that's about all I have. Great. And Thank you very much, Amanda. You're welcome. That, that, so again, <laughs> uh, we will be putting out a follow-up message to everyone, which will include the link for this, uh, for this map. So or it's on the original information sheet. Now, I am told that that the person speaking can go to full screen, um, but I've also been told that I have to command full screen for uh, everybody. So I don't, th th we have a technical question that, <laughs> Lindsay, if you can send me some instructions would be helpful. All right, so, and the other thing is I've muted uh, all of the other speakers, because every time you make a uh, a move that's heard on the microphone, uh, your picture comes up. Um, and uh, so, Brewster, what a, Brewster Rhodes is going to give a more granular account of the student strike, Brewster. Uh, I met when he was with the coalition to stop funding the war. Um, and then after that, he went off to Cincinnati and became very involved in Ohio politics and, and in environmental programs. So Brewster, take it from here. Well, thanks, John. And thanks for bringing us together. Uh, I'm, there are a number of people I recognize uh, from the list of attendees. So that's cool. What a shout out to, to old friends. Um, mine will be a little bit more personal, uh, and I do have a uh, slideshow, so I'm going to do the share screen deal, John. All right. Okay. Um, and hopefully eh, get this going here. Uh, okay. My kids are yelling at me like, Dad, Dad you already blew it. Okay. So um, the first week of May in 1970 uh, really shaped my life as an activist. Uh, as an 18-year-old freshman, at Williams College in Massachusetts, I attended the May Day Free Bobby Rally um, in New Haven. And uh, it was quite an experience. And, but of course, on Thursday, the 30th of April, on the eve of the rally, Nixon um, went live on TV to announce his invasion of Cambodia. Um, and rally speakers, I mean, this was a shock. It was heard around the country, around the world. And rally speakers the next day uh, tied the repression of the Panther Party uh, to Nixon's expansion of the war. And it was time to stop business as usual, to organize and take action, not just protest, they, they said, um, and urged. Uh, and that night, the streets of New Haven were filled with tear gas. Uh, bombs went off, but only 72 people got arrested. Uh, Tom Hayden and John Freund shared a meeting the next day uh, to discuss their call for a nationwide student strike. And over 500 people uh, turned out for the, uh, from around the country, packed Yale's chapel, as they presented a draft of uh, three strike demands. Um, after endless debate, a vote was called and the demands as you see on the screen here, which were already reviewed by Amanda, um, were adopted. And you know what they were, um, but there was the poster that went all over the country that summarized, this is what we're standing up about and what we're uh, demanding be changed. So the strike was officially launched uh, with Wednesday, May 6th, tagged as the start date. It felt like an historic and hopeful moment. Uh, we were channeling our rage into concrete coordinated action that would focus our organizing work on our campuses and in our communities. Uh, we spent the next three hours in committees uh, to plan strike organizing before it was, it was presented the next day. 
uh, to the full uh, rally crowd. Uh, as, aver as the advertising manager for my campus newspaper, I attended the college press caucus where editors and staff hammered out the first draft of what became a joint editorial that ran in dozens of college newspapers the following Tuesday. Other teams met to organize a rally in Washington the following Saturday, lobby members of Congress, plan direct action protests, mobilize faculty, engage student governments, reach out to local communities, and more. And the rally, at the rally that afternoon, Tom presented the call for a national student strike uh, and read the demands. The crowd chanted, strike, 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 for what seemed like an endless time, although the press reports said it was eight minutes that that chant went on. Um, and organizing committees met again that evening, afternoon and evening, uh, to flesh out strategy, exchange contact information, and create a communication hub, uh, the task that was taken on by the students at Brandeis, as Amanda mentioned. Uh, when I finally made it back to Williams that next afternoon, I was shocked to see handmade strike banners hanging from dorm windows as Volunteers of America blasted away. Uh, I've never to this day seen this level of spontaneous self-mobilization. They didn't even wait for us to come back and organize them. Imagine that. Uh, our May Day New Haven team met that night and decided to call a meeting, a campus-wide meeting, the following night, uh, Monday the 4th, to mobilize support for, uh, for Williams joining the national strike. When news broke about Kent State that afternoon, the next afternoon, it all became personal. Uh, Nixon was bringing the war home to us. Now they were coming after us. All of a sudden, it got real. Students and faculty who I never saw take any political action on campus all of a sudden woke up and jumped in. That night, 1,200 students, and I'm somewhere in this picture on the far right, Nearly the entire student body of Williams at the time packed the chapel. After hours of debate, we voted to go on strike and endorse the three demands. Uh, I was the secretary for the meeting and still have those notes uh, somewhere in my files. Um, organizing committees sprung up overnight. Um, one initiative uh, led by uh, a faculty member captured the imagination of uh, of, of, of lots of students at Williams, uh, the idea of organizing a nationwide one-hour work stoppage tagged Pause for Peace, you can see on the front page of the Williams record. I didn't make any money that week, by the way, selling ads. Uh, the project took off as over 300 committees in 42 states tried to get local governments, corporations, small businesses, and nonprofits to stop their activities for one hour, and they picked May 27th at the time to protest the escalation of the war. The project finally fizzled out two weeks later as, Nixon, as the Nixon administration threatened business leaders. Um, 500 Williams students went to D.C. Uh, for the May 9th rally, which was organized by Dr. Spock and Ron Young. Uh, I didn't realize that until I did a little research about it, but I was responsible for organizing about 50 buses to get Western Mass students uh, to the demonstration. Over 100,000 people showed up uh, with about 150,000 attending a similar demonstration uh, in San Francisco at the same time, eh, probably three hours off. Um, it's amazing to think about this, but at 5 a.m. that morning, 4.30 or 5, Nixon went to the Lincoln Memorial to talk with students. He walked there with just his valet. The Secret Service scrambled to catch up to him. Haldeman later called it the weirdest day of the Nixon administration, quote, unquote. While most Williams students resumed their studies, and started summer jobs by the end of May, I think they really played a big role in collaboration with many others, convincing Representative Silvio Conti, our local congressman from Western Massachusetts there, um, to become one of the leading Republican opponents of the war. And in fact, in 1974, uh, he was the lead Republican sponsor of what became known as the Conti Aspen Esch Amendment to the Foreign Aid Appropriations Bill which cut U.S. military aid to the Saigon regime by 50% and sent a shockwave to Ford that, hey, uh, this game is over. So I believe that our voices were heard. We made a difference, and, and many of us became activists for the rest of our lives as a result of this work. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Brewster. Um, now, if I've figured it out properly, everybody in the, who is attending will now have the speaker as, as the primary uh, part of their screen. So somebody should send me a chat if I haven't 
or Lindsay especially, if I haven't done it right. Um, our next speaker, we now go to one of what's the best known event of this period nationally is Kent State. Um, and uh, I am, there Alan is, okay. Alan Canfor is one of, he's going to give you his own account of what happened and what he sees the significance of Kent State. He was a wounded at by the shootings and has been very active ever since in keeping this memory alive, Alan. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here at my first ever Zoom conference. So uh, it's very significant though. I'm so impressed by the panelists and in particular the information about the National Student Strike, which clearly at this date needs to be publicized even more because it's uh, so significant that it was the largest student strike in the United States history and some say the world. So if, if people understand that between four and five million students went into action in May of 1970, uh, I, I just think that's a, a footnote of history that needs to be written much larger. So I'm very uh, glad to have heard the information so far about the student strike. At Kent, we heard about the student strike. I mean, the word was out there uh, after Nixon invaded Cambodia on April 30th. And there was a buzz out there. And uh, on Friday, May the 1st, the next evening, there was kind of a spontaneous uprising in downtown Kent. There were maybe two or 300 activists, long-haired, radical, anti-war people just spontaneously gathered in the downtown area. And that was after a 12 o'clock noon rally, which was entirely peaceful on the campus. They buried a copy of the US Constitution with a shovel. Uh, Black United students had a rally at 3 or 4 p.m., similarly peaceful. But at night, that's where the militants kind of took over. And after a few bottles were thrown at police cars going by downtown at the uh, one of the main streets, North Water Street, then the crowd went into the street. And then we moved down the street and some people out of the crowd of maybe 300, about maybe 10 students started breaking windows, bank windows mostly. Uh, also some loan companies, the army recruiter, uh, the, the gas, the electric, the telephone monopolies. So this kind of galvanized the situation in Kent, Ohio. Since then, I've read that in uh, the same thing was happening in Cambridge, Massachusetts that very evening and elsewhere around the country where some students like me and others were aware that a few months earlier in November of 69, Nixon said he was going to ignore the 500,000 peaceful protesters outside the White House. And he said he was gonna watch a football game. Uh, I think that kind of sent a message to people that Nixon wasn't listening to peaceful protest. So by, by May of 1970, some of us, including myself and my roommates, we had just attended the funeral of a young 19 year old soldier who was killed in Vietnam on April 13th, his funeral was April 24th. So Nixon invaded Cambodia six days later, and there we were in downtown Kent a week after that funeral, and we joined that militant protest, trying to send a message to President Nixon. Well, the next, uh, next evening, something similar happened where basically the same 300 uh, long-haired uh, anti-war students, males and females, gathered on the campus. We marched around, our crowd increased to about 2,000. We returned in the darkness right around uh, 9 p.m. to the ROTC area, where we were very surprised to see that there were no police around, even though the campus police station was just up over the hill, about 200 yards away. And the cops stayed away for the next 60 minutes, which is very significant and peculiar, suspicious. Uh, so that gave the students then an opportunity to first break the windows. Still, the cops didn't come. So people got a little bolder with some uh, railroad flares, which didn't work. Uh, they rolled off the roof of the building. Uh, one kid had a Molotov cocktail, which bounced off the building, caught the ground on fire. It was a very inept attempt to burn the building. And in fact, the building wouldn't catch on fire until a few students went over to a motorcycle that was parked nearby. They dipped their handkerchiefs in the gas tank, and then they set the building on fire on one little window sill of a, of a corner of the building. Now the building was made out of wood, it was rickety, it was falling apart. And some people are speculate that, well, maybe the university or, or Governor Rhodes in Columbus wanted to have an incident, like a Reichstag fire type of deal. 
But the fact is, it remains a mystery how the building did burn down that night. But the fact is, students did set fire to it very ineptly. Then once the students were all chased away, when the cops finally arrived, uh, that's when the building went up in flames when it was already surrounded by the uh, city and the county police. So it's, it's a mystery what happened that night. But the fact is, students tried to burn the building. The building did burn once it was under the control of the police. And that was the exact moment then when the National Guard rolled into Kent. Approximately 800 guardsmen came onto the campus. Another 400 guardsmen went into the city of Kent. So there were 1,200 guardsmen armed with uh, M1 rifles mainly, which have a range of about two miles. Their bullets can pierce through steel as we found out on uh, May 4th when uh, numerous cars were penetrated by the bullets. And they occupied the campus and the city. They set up their tents, they had Jeeps, they had armored vehicles, a lot of trucks, and they were just everywhere on the campus and in the city. Well, the next morning, uh, the governor came, Governor James Rhodes, who was a conservative Republican pro-war governor, running for an election for the US Senate in a Republican primary which was hotly contested. And Rhodes, our governor, was approximately 8% behind a man by the name of Taft. And that's a popular name in Ohio. So Rhodes was facing his biggest election of his life behind by 8%. So he gave this really tough law and order type speech. He condemned the students as the worst type of people in America, worse than the communists, worse than the brown shirts. He pounded his fist on the podium. It was basically a campaign speech two days before his election. And he said, we're going to eradicate the problem. Well, that rhetoric that evening then inspired the National Guard to stab quite a few students, at least a half dozen students were stabbed and cut and pierced by bayonets uh, the night before the shooting incident. And then it was that kind of a situation where you had two days of uh, anti-property violence by the students, followed up then by what became two days of anti-student violence First, the bayonetings on Sunday night, May 3rd. And then, of course, the next day when they ended up shooting into the crowd, killing four and wounding nine, including me. So on May 4th, uh, we did have a rally that was planned at noon. We thought it was going to be peaceful. Nobody intended to attack the grass or the trees on our grassy open commons area. But at 12 o'clock noon, as soon as our rally began, the National Guard fired a tremendous amount of tear gas. 113 soldiers marched toward us. About 30 split off to the left and they occupied a bit of land. So they didn't go forward with the main group, but it was that main group, about 76 men, including their officers. They chased us up over a hill. They went down the other side of the hill where they gathered on a practice football field. This was about five minutes before the shootings. And at this point, there was a photograph taken of a, uh, as James Michener described me, a brazen young man with a black flag I ventured a little close. I was about 150 feet away, which still I think is pretty far away. And I didn't really think my life was in danger until they started kneeling and aiming and, and aiming some of those rifles toward me. Still, I held my ground. I didn't think that they would shoot and they didn't. So they regrouped. They started marching back up the hillside. And it was at that point out of the 76 guardsmen when they reached the top of the hill, which of course militarily is significant, the hilltop, uh, only about a dozen men, the same ones that were down there kneeling a few minutes earlier, uh, that small group at the right end of the formation stopped, turned, raised their weapons, they began to fire, and they continued to fire for 12.53 seconds, a total of about 67 gunshots. They fired down the hillside where they wounded four of us. The closest was 76 feet away. Then there was another kid is about 90 feet away. Down near the bottom of the hill is where I was shot uh, 176 feet away as I got behind an oak tree. I felt a bullet pass through my right wrist. And my roommate, uh, Tom Grace, was out in the open. He was shot through his left foot. Uh, the bullet blew open the bottom of his uh, left foot. He was maimed for life. So they wounded four of us on the hillside, but most of their shots were fired behind us, way out in a parking lot area, where the most radical students had been gathered a few minutes earlier. And that's where they killed four at distances of about 250 feet all the way out to almost 400 feet away. Two of the students that were killed were protesters. Jeff Miller, who was in that famous picture with a young woman screaming over his dead body. He was uh, my friend. Uh, he uh, was shot through his face. The bullet passed through his head, killed instantly. And he was the closest, but he was still about 250 feet away. 
Further out in the parking lot, you had Allison Krauss, also a protester, shot through her arm. The bullet went into her chest. She was killed. And then further out into the distant part of the parking lot, you had two bystanders on their way to their classrooms. Although they were at the rally and they were anti-war, they were sympathetic, but they weren't really a big part of the protest. Bill Schroeder, an ROTC cadet, shot in the back, killed. Sandy Scheuer, shot through her throat, killed. And these were all by M1 bullets that were fired. Four more were injured out in that area and another one off to the side of the hill uh, at pretty far distances away. One kid was paralyzed, shot in the back and paralyzed for life, Dean Kaler. So then afterwards that day, you had basically the cover-up started. The generals on the scene blamed the victims as they always do, as they did at Jackson State 10 days earlier when James Earl Green and Philip Gibbs were killed. They blamed the victims. At Kent, they said, we were shooting at the guardsmen. They said that we were throwing all these objects. And the FBI later concluded there was no student sniper and no guardsman was hurt by a rock except for one guardsman 15 minutes before the shootings. So those were the kinds of uh, stories that the guards started telling. And basically it was the beginning of the cover up. And when we had such a devastating blow to ourselves as victims, it was a very lonely, difficult day until we started getting those reports about the national student strike spreading from coast to coast. It was exhilarating to us, those of us who survived, to hear that from the West Coast to the East Coast, all over, like Amanda pointed out, in all these states, four to five million students ultimately joined the national student strike. That was such a, uh, a positive uh, healing aspect that really began the, be the beginning of our healing process to see that our fellow students saw through the lies, saw through the cover-up, and joined that national student strike, which was unprecedented and hasn't been surpassed since. So that's the significance of Kent State. Now, there were some studies by the Urban Research Corporation and others who say that uh, the Kent State shootings uh, marked the uh, most significant factor, which contributed to 100 campuses each day shutting down that week. Uh, that may be true, but our intention at Kent was not to have any kind of bloodshed. We were just trying to join the national student strike. We were trying to send out our message to President Nixon that it was time to stop the war. And almost inadvertently, as fate would have it, that was the effect of our tragedy there at Kent State. Thank you, Alan. Uh, everybody will be open for questions afterwards. Um, and there are some great videos out from Kent State that you can find just by going online. We'll have some of them linked on it. If you didn't look at the information sheet coming into this, we will circulate a link to it again afterwards and, and you can uh, see some uh, shorter videos, but there's also a new film that uh, was shown on PBS by local stations last week uh, and that hopefully will get more national viewing. So on the other side of the world, <laughs> just at that date, was Frank Joyce. And I should say that Frank, as well as Brewster, as well as Terry, are part of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. Frank has a long history in the civil rights movement and Northern support, and also in the anti-war movement, and was once upon a time a journalist even. I, discovered with some surprise. Uh, Frank. Hi, John. Thanks. Thanks to Alan and the other panelists. And as John said, I'm really proud to be a part of the committee that's putting this uh, webinar together. What I want to do to set the context for my story is point out something that gets lost too often in the history. And that is that our anti-war movement is a complete aberration in US history. From the beginning, of our country into the present, we have basically been a violent war-making nation. But this one time, this one war, we weren't. And millions upon millions of people were involved in the opposition, not just students, by the way. An enormous energy and creativity was unleashed by this movement. There were a lot of factors that made that possible, including uh, particularly the civil rights movement. But I think what gets the least credit uh, is the part played by the Vietnamese themselves. Now, many people, of course, acknowledge the success of the Vietnamese military, and rightly so, but there was more to it. 
the Vietnamese had an exemplary diplomatic strategy, and part of it came to be called people's diplomacy. Uh, that's why we wrote this book, The People Make the Peace. I have to put in a little plug here. Uh, and uh, John is one of the authors of the book as well, uh, that talks in detail about this component. Um, but it was because of people's diplomacy that on May 4th, 1970, I was in Northern Vietnam. And our group of four people that was there were not the first. Anti-war activists first started going to Northern Vietnam in 1965. The first group included Stoughton Lynn, Tom Hayden, and Herbert Apthecker, and continued uh, to go to Vietnam until the war ended. In fact, technically, I think John was the last one since he arrived just as the war was ending, 10 years after these delegations be had started. There were about 200 of us who went during the war. Now, of course, some people called us traitors. I never felt that way. One reason I was against the war was that I could never figure out how it was that the Vietnamese were supposed to be my enemy. And in that context, by the way, I want to mention another anniversary. Today is the 53rd anniversary of the day that Muhammad Ali was indicted for draft evasion. And when Muhammad Ali defied the draft and refused induction in the first place, he said, I don't have no quarrel with those Viet Cong. Well, neither did I. <laughs> and to be in that via in Vietnam at that time, obviously, was an eye-opening experience. Hanoi was a striking city in so many ways. First off, it seemed calm, even serene, given what was going on. It was fragrant, clean, and well-organized. Everybody seemed to have a purpose. This is a series of pictures. Sorry for the old tech here. I couldn't get access to this digitally, but it's hard to see. But this is a picture of a, maybe an eight-year-old girl cleaning up leaves and putting them in a bag um, in, the, uh, in a park in downtown Hanoi. The sense of social bonding and cohesion that I experienced in Vietnam when I was there was not like anything I had ever seen before in the United States. And just think about for a moment our current situation. Here we are facing what should be a unifying enemy if ever there was one, the coronavirus. And yet we're at each other's throats, just as was the case on May 4th, 1970. Wherever we went in Vietnam, even though there were air raid sirens, bombed out areas, many other signs of war, people were determined and well organized. One of our visits was to a village south of Hanoi. And I'm going to try and put this, I do have digitally, I'm going to try and put this picture up now so that people can see it. Um, this was the cover of a calendar that I produced the year uh, after I came back. And uh, this village, uh, which, as I hope you can see from this picture, uh, had itself been bombed. The night that we were staying there, as soon as we woke up in the morning, our host spoke to us in the most somber terms you can imagine about Kent State. I remember it to this day. They said that four had been killed. They were sad and upset, and it was a cliche to say that the Vietnamese distinguish between U.S. citizens and the U.S. government, but that distinction was very clear and very real in that moment. And they also seemed to sense that the Kent State murders would be some kind of turning point within the U.S., and as we have, just based on the fact that white students had been killed, it was clear to me that that would be the case as well, and it was true. When I got back to Detroit, many people I had previously known to be apathetic or wishy-washy about the war were now actively opposed. As someone said already, it was clear the war had come home in new ways. The massive campus demonstrations were one sign, and it was clear that we were in the beginning of a powerful new phase in our movement. In closing, I want to repeat something I say every chance I get we built a great anti-war movement once, and we should be proud of it. And there is no reason that we can't do so again. And wow, do we ever need to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frank, we did not see the picture. Did you click on share? I did. And then on the 
picture itself, there's another place. On that screen that you see, you have to click on share at the bottom. Yeah, I did that. Okay, well, all right. Sorry. Live and learn. That. We're still still living and still yeah. learning. Okay. That's too bad. Well, okay. We will come back, hopefully, and see it at the end. Um, to everyone, not all of the audience are people who were part of the anti-war movement or, ah, there we go. Okay. There it is. There is this picture. Click the wrong place. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Um, not everybody who's listening and watching today was part of the anti-war movement. Actually, one person in when he registered wrote and said that that his was uh, the the music of the '60s was one what interested him, and that's why he was coming on. Well, we're very lucky to have a person who was a symbol uh, and not just a symbol in a theoretical sense, but a still active participant in the anti-war and social justice movements. Uh, Peter was part of Peter, Paul and Mary, but he's also all by himself, Peter Yarrow. I'm here. Yep, you got the mic. But, but I'm not seeing myself. Okay, Frank, you should shut the sharing. Okay. Okay. Yep. Right. Well, um, it, it, it is true. Uh, you, uh, it, you just alluded to this, uh, Dean Taylor did, to the fact that, um, that we had a, a demonstration in uh, November um, of 1969 with a half a million people. And that was, uh, and this is important to note that was, it was the largest demonstration historically that had ever taken place in the United States. Uh, and uh, it was in DC where we had had the March on Washington. And we had a half a million people there, but the, uh, there were two components, one, a, uh, a, a, a candle-like march, putting the names of the Vietnamese war dead, uh, and the American soldiers into coffins, which were then through the night, one by one put into the coffins and then born to the Pentagon symbolically, uh, placing responsibility for this. And then uh, at, I believe 10 o'clock the next morning, we started what was called the celebration of life. And that was a demonstration with a half a million people where there was just music. And um, the, the, the role of music at that time was profound because it, um, it united our, our souls and our hearts. And it, uh, in, in this particular case, I was the co-organizer with Cora Weiss, who um, was, has, uh, was a, a lifetime activist and uh, was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. But uh, at the time, uh, what I did was I mobilized the, the, the performing artists, which was something I was engaged in doing ordinarily, but in this case, instead of it's being the, the usual sub, uh, su uh, suspects, what I wanted to do was to demonstrate that the opposition to the war w encompassed uh, 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 all kinds of music, pop music and, uh, um, and uh, country music, so, uh, as well as folk music. And so we had John Denver and Earl Scruggs from uh, uh, for Flat and Scruggs. So we had the cast of hair from Broadway. We had the string quartet from the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra, Mitch Miller, Pete Seeger, Peter, Paul and Mary, etc. cetera. And um, music was such a, a powerful dynamic then that it, uh, it allowed 
the, the reverberations of that when it was 90% of that was, was just music and it wasn't just, uh, it, it had the character not just of, of, of addressing the war but saying we want to live in a humane way. We, we, the, the, the scope of the statement was very, very profound and broad. And, uh, and so uh, this, uh, you know, I, I, Mary and Noel and I, Noel Paul Stuckey and I, were back in Kent State uh, 25 years later. And we were uh, uh, with, uh, oh, excuse me, I was mistaken. Dean Taylor was the, uh, was the student in the, uh, in the wheelchair that I was referring to before, not one of the speakers here. Dean Taylor, and we were surrounding him and weeping with him and singing together. And, um, and, and we had a teach-in. The, the es 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 essence of what happened in, the, uh, in this uh, closing of the campuses throughout the United States was that there was a sense that business as usual could not continue. And when they had the teach-ins, which and we had a teach-in at that 25 years, we sang and we spoke about what was going on. And in doing so, we weren't just simply idly saying we're not going to participate. We were actively talking about an aspirational perspective that would say, not only are we against this, but this is what we wish to construct. And that was very, very important in the spirit of what was created. And all of that bears a huge lesson for uh, students and for uh, adults and for we who remember it today, because there comes a point where we say we cannot, we can no longer say we are not going to uh, en engage in this in some kind of way that may bring us some jeopardy. And as we live in this, uh, this period, when we see so many of the things that we've fought to, to bring to bear in terms of social justice, in terms of respect, in terms of addressing racism and uh, the oppression of women, and, uh, and, we, and we're living in an era where we see that uh, all of those things are jeopardized, not just culturally, but inst as institutions, we have to remember that there does come a time that can reiterate the, uh, the reality of what, um, what existed when with a sense, this cannot continue, this is not possible in our country. It is not possible for it to happen that this is going on. And one of the experiences I had that, that is the legacy of this is when Tim De Christopher, who was a, uh, uh, a, a dem demonstrator at a, 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 an auction that was uh, auctioning off land in, in, uh, in, in Salt, uh, near Salt Lake City, and uh, and and he uh, he uh, t took a uh, he went inside and they said, "Do you want to? Are you here to bid?" And he said, "Yes." And he lifted his paddle, and he a million two hundred thousand dollars later, he had bought a lot of land, but he didn't have a pen a penny, and he. Uh, he, he, that was the moment where he was said the business as usual cannot go on because, and this was in terms of the climate reality, because this auction for lands uh, were all, they were bordering uh, the national parks and it was for the oil and gas industry and it was the last days of, uh, of, of the ad administration of, um, um, uh, of uh, our... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I before the um, when he was sentenced, and it was George W. Bush that I was referring to. I stood outside when he was being sentenced. He refused to go to trial nine times, and when he did indeed go to trial, we went down there and we had a lot of music. Again, this music bringing people together and I was standing out there and I was singing for the people 
uh, who were there, and then there were people in the courtroom, and he was sentenced to two years in federal penitentiary for this act of uh, bidding on land and when he didn't have any money at a federal auction, which was later negated because it was illegal. So I sang this, and I and this has to do with the spirit that we all share. It was assured. We felt we had the dynamic. We had the heart of America with us. Come gather round, people, wherever you roam, and admit that the waters round have grown. And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, please get out of the new one. If you can't lend a hand, for the times they are a change. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. Don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one If you can't lend a hand For the times They are a change Come senators, congressmen Please heed the call Don't stand in the doorway Don't block up the hall for he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. For the times they are a change. And at this point, while I was singing it, I said to everybody, I said, you know, this, there comes a time when we have to stop business as usual. And maybe we have to put ourselves in harm's way and commit an act of civil disobedience. And so I said, sing the, the chorus with me. So everybody who's out there, you can sing, even though you're in a room alone. Oh, the times, they are a change. And then it said, mothers and fathers throughout the land, don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't get it to lend a hand. For the times, they are a change. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, Bob Dylan's words. The slow one now will later be fast. And the present now will later be past. For the times, they are a change. With me. For the times, they are a change. So we went home. He was given two years. It's extraordinary what happened in federal penitentiary. And I got a call when I received, when I went home, I said, but I remembered what you said. It's time sometimes to stop, as they did, in this, in, in, and after Kent State. 
And I went in and I went along with the people and I, I, I got arrested. We all went and got arrested, 46 of us. We first went to one place, the police wouldn't arrest us. Then we, we occupied where a trolley car, the trolley car came, then they arrested us. And they said, okay, if you just go, it's okay. And they said, no, we want to be arrested. So there comes a time when this history is not history to be remembered, but to be relived. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Um, we are, Peter will be back uh, later in the program and at the end of it. Um, and now we're going to shift to a very different kind of event. It's usually conflated in uh, the publicity or people's minds, Kent State, Jackson State. But in fact, Jackson State had a very different trajectory uh, and a very different story attached to it. And we're very honored to have one of the students who was wounded at Jackson State, who then went on to have an accomplished career as a teacher and a principal, and now as a realtor, uh, Gala Porter from Jackson, Mississippi. Gala. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you, John, and the rest of the panelists for allowing me to participate in this uh, special webinar. I need for the listening audience to um, use their imagination at this point. I need you to think of a thoroughfare that's, that divides a campus. You have on the left-hand side of the campus a women's dormitory, Alexander Hall, and on the right-hand side of that fair affair, you have classrooms and uh, the cafeteria, student cafeteria. And in the middle of that fair affair, you have a traffic light. I hope you have this visual uh, in mind at this point because it plays a significant uh, role in what took place uh, on May 14th and May 15th. Uh, there was student arrest, uh, unrest because of the motorists shouting obscenities to female students on Jackson State College campus and using the N-word while traveling to the main street that ran the campus to get to downtown Jackson. Now, at this point, I'm gonna tell you what occurred on May 14th and 15th. 1970. Confrontations were between white and black Jackson residents. A rumor that a local politician and civil rights leader, Charles Evers, and his wife were killed. And of course, I still hope that you have that visual of that thoroughfast dividing the campus and it linked to West Jackson downtown. As a survivor of the Gibbs Green Massacre, I want to step back in time and share with you one of the most horrendous tragedies that I have ever encountered in my life. I will share with you what I remember that occurred at, at observing what was going on down the street off campus. I want you to know that I could have lost my life on that night for no reason. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't shouting profanity. Um, I wasn't um, throwing anything. I was just outside standing on the campus uh, in front of the dormitory, the women's dormitory. But because of people of the opposite race than me, having so much hatred and ignorance and racism in their heart, we were shot upon. I believe it could have happened. I believe it could happen again if we do not prepare ourselves educationally, spiritually, and politically. Now, let me get to
for a Thursday evening. I was getting ready for bed and had just rolled my hair in these large soup cans. Yes, I said soup cans because I had a lot of hair back then and I wanted to keep my, my, my style. After that, someone yelled on the hall, the corner boys are burning a vehicle down the street. The corner boys were young men that did not attend Jackson State. They were not a part of the Jackson State family, but they often entertained us with their actions. My classmate and I, of course, went outside at that moment to see what was truly going on down the street. I remember the sounds of footsteps that echoed as local and state police officers marched toward Alexander Hall. There were about 50 to 60 officers who were marching. They were dressed in riot gear. They turned and faced our dormitory. One officer said, may I have your attention? And that's when the barrage of bullets started flowing. Uh, we were still seated and once the bullets started flowing, of course, we jumped up and tried to protect ourselves. I remember hearing the bullets whisk past my head while hitting the ground, the glass, the building, and some students. I remember hearing bullets whizzing past my face and something hitting and tearing into my skin. Like these, my injuries were from the glass, concrete, and shrapnel from the shooting. I remember a very close friend from my hometown picking me up and pushing me through the broken glass of the dorm, dorm's door. He shielded me, and while he was shielding, uh, while he shielded me, uh, he reached for my roommate but she jerked away and ran into the dorm. When she did that, she was shot in the right arm. I remember faces of my fellow classmates who were crying and terrified of the unbelievable, unspeakable and senseless act. Roommates were, uh, my roommate asked me if she had been shot. She was crying uncontrollably bleeding proficiently, bleeding uh, prof uh, proficiently as I tried to get her help. I remember telling her that uh, the campus police were on their way and they would come and help her. When they arrived, they put her in a campus police auto, automobile. Then they looked at me and said, you need medical attention also. I, I said, oh no. I am waiting on my parents. They will come and get me and uh, take me to a hospital. And you know, my parents came and they took me to a hospital that was called King Daughters. And it was near my hometown. At that point, they began to examine me. They pulled pellets out of my hand. Uh, they pulled glass from my arms, they pulled concrete from my legs, arms, and hand. And I had a few stitches. I remember being told that two students, Philip Lafayette Gibbs, a 21-year-old JSU student, had been killed. I remember that James Earl Green, a 17-year-old Jim Hill student, senior, was shot and killed. Well, I'm riding home in the car with my parents and they are asking me what happened. And I shared with them that the story that I'm sharing with you, the, the events, the details that I shared. I told them that we were not doing anything or I wasn't doing anything. I had just come out of the dorm to see what was going on. At that point, uh, I uh, did not want to return to the campus, but I did hear that the president of the college closed the campus 
due to a safe environment, due to the killings. All campus activities, including the 1970 commencement exercises for graduating seniors had been canceled. But each year, Jackson College uh, celebrates, commemorates this event by having course contents in various courses and uh, university-wide programs that students can participate uh, in and the greater uh, community could uh, also participate. Well, it's 19, it is 2000, uh, 2020 and had planned for those students to come back and graduate uh, this year. But guess what? The COVID-19 pandemic has postponed those exercises again. At this point, we do not know when we will have the, the event, the graduation activities. But we do know we will have them. And uh, so we're looking forward to that occurring on the campus. Now, even though this happened 50 years ago, it is my opinion that we can eradicate this type of behavior from ever occurring again. And it can be summarized in these words. We need to become educationally driven, spiritually driven, and politically driven. And briefly, I will describe what that means. We should educate our children, not today, but tomorrow and every day of their lives. If this occurs, ultimately the goal will become uh, for those students to become financially uh, stable citizen. And I believe this will eliminate many of our societal ills. Spiritually driven, we should not use spiteful uh, actions against any race of people. We should practice being caring, sharing, and loving. These are key factors for creating an environment that will promote harmony amongst all races. And uh, it will prevent injustices uh, and hatred politically. Politically driven, uh, we should always engage ourselves in the political process. We should know who the candidates are. And once we understand that, we should get out and vote. So I call this the ESP. Now I'm gonna share one other event that took place um, not on campus, but off campus. My brother played baseball and they were in Alabama playing a game. The fans of, of this university shouted the words, they're killing you using the N word in Jackson, and we're going to kill you using the word if you win this game. Well, uh, needless to say, they did not win the game. They did do. They did complete two wins out of three. Uh, but my brother shares that, and uh, we thought, okay, here we go again. While I really didn't know Gibbs and Green uh, personally. I believe they would want us to practice being educationally driven, spiritually driven, and politically driven before we act. Using <clears throat> ESP could prevent this type of evil behavior from ever occurring again. What do you think? Thank you, Gayla. Thank you very much. Um, the one of the, uh, the, a book has just been written by Nancy Bristow uh, that you can find like everything else on Amazon. But uh, if you want the whole history of Jackson State, there's no better resource than that. Um, we also, preparation for this, received a note from a 
Jan Hillegas, who was a SNCC worker, that we should mention that Ben Brown, a SNCC person, I don't know if he was a SNCC person or just a local activist who was killed three years before Jackson's, the Jackson State shootings just down the street. So what Jackson State was, was an older and yet current history, as we've seen with the shooting in Georgia of the uh, African-American jogger and the two months it took for, and the national media attention it took for that to get addressed. So um, we're, it wasn't the same as Kent State, but it was part of the same uh, environment that was existing in the country at that point and certainly was exacerbated by Richard Nixon's uh, rhetoric and his encouragement of uh, the most vicious parts of, of local police and state police to act out against students. And um, there is, you'll see at the end, I'll have an information sheet up and we'll also send it around in the follow-up message that on the evening of the 14th, uh, there will be an event broadcast from Jackson State um, that you can link into just as Kent State had something on the 4th that you can link into uh, to see how both of those communities have put forward their memories and what's important uh, since neither of them were able to do the, the big events that they had hoped to do. So we are shifting now to, we've gone to the South and now to the West Coast. If Jackson State is less known than Kent State, even less known is the Chicano Moratorium. Um, and we're, we included it, it isn't in May, it's in August, but we included it because it is uh, a very important dimension of anti-war activity, but one which blends over into domestic justice issues also. Uh, our speakers are the co-chairs of the 50th anniversary commemoration. Hopefully by the end of August that they will actually be able to have an event, but we will all see about that. Uh, Jorge Rodriguez uh, is spent, has spent his whole life in this uh, process uh, from a high school on. Uh, Lupe Carrasco Cardona is a more recent participant in this, and the two of them together are co-chairing the anniversary. So take it away. As I'm going to go ahead and finish. share my screen now. And um, even though the Chicano Moratorium uh, on a national scale may be a little lesser known, it's definitely uh, very well known in East Los Angeles, where we're from. <laughs> Oh, well, no, Sorry. wrong button. So, uh, so yes, as you said, um, it, the, this moratorium, the, this Chicano moratorium that we're commemorating um, from August 29th, 1970 is not the first of the Chicano moratoriums. It's just the one that resulted in a similar type of, um, of violence committed by um, the Sheriff's Department and, and the Los Angeles Police Department. And so this is why we are, we commemorate this one. And as you said right now, we were set to have a really large commemoration for August 29th, 2020, which regardless of whether or not the, the country opens up or the state of California opens up, we have already decided as a committee, we will postpone for 2021. But we're gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of our presentation. Um, we just wanna ensure the safety of, um, the people who would want to celebrate with us and especially our elders who, um, you know, a lot of them will be participating. So we want to ensure safety and, and, and uh, that the COVID-19 doesn't get any more of us than it already is. So Koki? Yeah. So the Chicano Moratorium, well, before the Chicano Moratorium, uh, there was a series of actions across the country starting in 69 
to begin educating and involving <clears throat> the Mexican Chicano community against the war. And that effort was led by Rosalio Munoz, who was the uh, student body president at UCLA and refused induction in September of 1669 into the armed forces. So as, as it went on, there was a, a, a decision made to move forward um, and, and begin a series of, of demonstrations about the country. Uh, I, as a high school student, organized the largest anti-war demonstration on March 6th at Roosevelt High School in Los Angeles uh, Unified School District. Over 2,500 students assembled at this free speech area denouncing the invasion of, uh, of, of uh, Laos, Cambodia and the continued bombing of the Vietnam people at that time. So it, it was real important for us to stage that demonstration. The administration ended up closing the school and the next day we ended up having 25 schools throughout the county of LA go out and protest for culturally relevant education. And I've been around uh, doing this even in, in, in taking a stand against the war in Vietnam. This was in the sixth grade. That's when the, uh, the monks were burning themselves uh, and protesting the war in, in Vietnam. So anyway, let's move on to the next slide, uh, uh, Lupe, because we, you know, we, we only have 10 minutes, so, <laughs> but, okay, so. so yeah. I can't hear you. Are folks able to hear Koki speaking? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, so Koki introduced a little bit about himself. He's, you know, a long time activist and, um, so I originally had put that I was a long time but lesser long um, activist. Um, I'm what you would call a red diaper baby. Uh, I was raised by um, a Chicano uh, movement activist who, you know, was a, a part of the uh, Campesino farm worker movement, and you know, my grandparents were as well. And so currently, I um, this is what brings me to this Chicano moratorium work is um, I. I'm a member of the Association of Raza Educators and other um, educational organizations that work for, as Koki said earlier, um, you know, people were asking, our people were asking for culturally relevant uh, curriculum. And so I'm currently a part of the movement here in the state of California to get ethnic studies passed as a um, graduation requirement. And so ethnic studies includes, you know, Chicano, Latino history, Asian American, African American, Native American. And so we are really working to ensure that the Chicano moratorium becomes something that, as you mentioned earlier, is, is more well known throughout the country um, and definitely among, um, you know, the, the students, the youth of California. Um, I also work with uh, Im immigration rights um, through an organization I belong to called Unión del Barrio, and I'm also um, a, a labor and teacher um, organizer. I'm a member of UTLA, uh, one of the largest uh, local uh, unions for teachers, United Teachers Los Angeles, and I'm a uh, California Teachers Association uh, representative. So that's kind of what brings me um, to this work. But, you know, um, I wasn't born in 1970. I was born six years later, but my father in 1980 was one of the um, speakers at the 1980 uh, Chicano Moratorium uh, commemoration. And then, um, and then, you know, I've been uh, actively involved in the organizing since the 45th. So, Koki? So, so the Chicago Moratorium uh, is a culmination of mass demonstrations throughout the uh, country. We mobilized to have a national m mobilization in August 29, 1970. So people, there was over 30,000 people that came to East LA to and join forces and walk in the streets of LA on a three mile, mile march to protest the war down the famous avenues of uh, Atlantic Boulevard and then Whittier. 
Atlantic Avenue and Whittier Boulevard. And as you see in this poster, I mean, in, in, in the shot here, you see people carrying coffee. And there was a large disproportion of people. Once you go to the next slide, Lupe. So there was a large disproportion of people, Chicanos, dying in that war, as well as Blacks. But 20% of the people that died in that war were of Mexican Chicano descent. And you see here uh, the police. Uh, the gathering was, uh, was uh, amazing. Uh, the the, the demonstrator, the rally, when people got to the rally site, you had American GI Forum people, you had old, old veterans uh, joining Vietnam, Chicano Vietnam veterans joining against the war, even Korean veterans joining. Here you see a picture of what eventually happened. The police, the LAPD, and the sheriff ended up disrupting and shooting tear gas and beating protesters, claiming that there was a theft in a nearby store. Uh, they ended up attacking the demonstration right when the rally was commencing, when speakers began to talk. Uh, there was a flood of hundreds of uh, sheriff's officers, as you see. They ran into the crowd, beating people. They began shooting tear gas. The people, the, the mothers and children and families that were there to protest the war in Vietnam. Um, so go to the next slide, Lupe. Uh, so we, uh, what ended up happening, you know, the people started fighting back. So a rebellion ensued, and there was four people that ended up dying uh, in, in this uh, unfortunate uh, disturbance that the police caused. Lynn Ward, Gustavo Montag, Jose Angel Diaz, and Ruben Salazar, who was a LA Time columnist and the director of the news station of uh, KMEX. And it was said that he was targeted because he was doing an investigation on the corruption and the police being on the take uh, by drugs uh, people uh, uh, during that particular time. Uh, and so they, if you, you see this shot right here to the left, I was across the street with the, uh, the photographer uh, who is now deceased with Fridge. He was, we were there and he was shooting these pictures and we just ended up together. And they pushed people back into the silver dollar. They forced, they ended up taking people out through the back, unbeknownst to us. Some guy came and looked. Next, next thing that happened, a sheriff now pulled the curtains back of the, that was the entrance of this particular bar, the silver dollar, and shot a projectile gas, uh, projectile gas uh, canister ending the life of Ruben Salazar. And uh, subsequently after that, uh, you know, they, they ended up with an inquest on his death. I was the youngest member of the East LA Community Blue Ribbon Committee that oversaw the LA County Coroner's Inquest, which was a farce. Uh, and they ended up exonerating the, uh, the sheriff who shot the projectile. Want to go to the next slide, uh, Lupe? You want to go to the next slide, Lupe? Do you... hey, so, anyway, so we, we, yeah, so we have been uh, protesting what, what, what the anti-war since East LA in the 80s, uh, in the 90s, we had uh, also the uh, uh, Mexicano Latino Committee Against the War in Iraq, and we continue that effort. And so we, as a community, have been against the war for many, many years, and we continue on that route. Do you want, do you want to go ahead and uh, take it from there, Lupe? Sure, yes. Um, so something that you can see um, on the right-hand side um, is Carlos Montes, who was one of the original um, participants in the Chicano Moratorium, uh, was uh, part of a, a demonstration that we organized in February of this year. And so we just wanted to show that our, um, 
our commemoration committee is still actively involved in the like ongoing um, struggle against uh, war and, and imperialism and you know the billions and billions yeah. that we're um, that we're using for the destruction of um, the earth and or trillions of dollars for the destruction of the earth and also for the peoples internationally and um, as as you know we're um, showing today the destruction of our um, our people here in this in this country today and so what I wanted to share with you is just um, some of our points of unity um, because it, the points of unity are really telling in that um, this this struggle for of 50 years is is still ongoing. Um, it's interesting that a lot of the things we were asking for 50 years ago remain almost completely intact, um, necessary today. And so um, some of our points of unity are that we will correctly use the original demands of the first moratoriums and expand our demands based on current ones. These demands include self-determination, the liberation of women, Chicano mil um, excuse me, ch uh, ending Chicano military drafting into wars like Vietnam, pro-peace, stopping U.S. military intervention, cutting the military budget, ending racism, ending police killings and crimes, proper access to bilingual and quality public education, good jobs, equality for all, access to health care, benefits for veterans and the elderly, housing, political representation, legalization for all, fair and humane immigration, environmental justice, uh, supporting the new Green Deal, solidarity with all oppressed nations of the world, stopping Trump's administration policies, ending white supremacy, uh, ending privatization of public and, and social services, and then lastly, um, that one of the, the, um, the things that is distinct about um, this 50th commemoration of the Chicano Moratorium is that um, it was very distinct um, that they wanted women or we wanted women to be uh, in leadership roles. Um, you know, those are one of the critiques of 50 years ago. And so the women are leading and contributing in this committee and breaking from the norms of patriarchy. Women are contributing and are part of the leadership. And that is partially how I came to become um, the co-chair. There are really um, amazing women that are part of our committee that were um, present 50 years ago, um, but I've been, you know, humbled and blessed to be trusted to, to um, hold this role. Um, and so uh, we were on set for um, August 29th, 2020 to commemorate the, um, the 50th year. We were going to do the, the original um, March in those um, famous streets that, um, that Koki mentioned earlier, Atlantic and Whittier. And we were gonna um, commence to what used to be called um, Laguna Park for a, a rally, which is now called Ruben Salazar Park, named after that um, Chicano journalist who was killed in the silver dollar. Um, you know, it's very um, important to note that this was one of the first uh, Chicano journalists to work for the Los Angeles Times who was murdered. Um, and so uh, at that, at that rally, we were going to have a lot of the similar types of solidarity speakers and, and people speaking to um, some of our um, our demands for for you know today. Um, but unfortunately, as y'all know, the pandemic um, is in full effect, and the pandemic actually has um, made it so that people who are not political can see what we have seen all along, and that is that this system is not set in a way that ensures that all people have equal access to things that are humane, like access to healthcare. We see right now that um, Black and Chicano, Latino, uh, Navajo, and Indigenous peoples are dying at higher rates than anyone else. Um, and we know that's because of the lack of access to healthcare. We know that's because of discrimination when they try to get treatments or tests in, hosp in hospitals or in clinics. And we know that aid has not been given that has been promised to areas um, that are hard hit, like the Navajo, the, the Diné uh, reservations and, and other reservations throughout the country. And so because of that, we as a um, core committee have already decided, as I said earlier, that um, we will not have our 2020 um, be a actual um, rally that is, is similar to what was um, done in 1970 and has done for other commemorations. Um, but we are most likely going to be doing a car, um, a car rally uh, a car protest and it will be um, broadcast live and will um, hopefully conclude with a, um, we're still in the works trying to figure these things out, but we'll conclude with um, 
with a, a, a live rally afterwards with some of us and some of our solidarity um, folks speaking about this need to continue um, to fight for these, these demands. Um, and then we'll possibly also have some um, live streaming of recorded um, cultural um, elements, uh, potentially a play um, called August 29th that originally before the pandemic was going to be um, opening live that night at the Latino Theater Company here in downtown Los Angeles. And so there's a potential for that to be um, recorded once all of the cast has been um, tested and found to be negative with uh, coronavirus. So let's hope that that happens. And we hope that uh, you all here today will, will be um, participants and in, in joining us that day, August 29th, 2020. And so if you um, would like to get more information, um, our emails are right here. Um, our website as well, where you can receive, you can get our emails and phone numbers and also uh, other contact information. So thank you so much for, for having us. Thank you. Yeah, Jorge, just one quick, you want, yeah, go ahead. We would, we would make a call to everybody who lives in LA to come join our caravan yeah. at 9 a.m. on August 29th. 2020 on the corner of Atlantic and Whittier Boulevard. Great, thank you. Well, thank you. And as I say, at the end, we will show inform an information sheet, which will allow people to go into the, um, what was done on the 4th at Kent State and the link for Jackson State on the 14th, uh, the 15th is when the shootings took place, but it was just after midnight. Um, and also the link, we will have the web page for the Chicano Moratorium. Um, Peter, I, if you don't mind, I wanna go into questions and then come back to you at the end, because uh, we are running a little late and I see the numbers diminishing. So while people are, are still with us and to hold them for your singing and, and remarks at the end, we'll do it that way. So Terry, do you have questions to one of the, who is it for and each, go ahead. Oh, I gotta unmute you, you can't, uh, there you go. All right, well, hi everybody and thanks for these presentations. We were up to 206 participants in the webinar and received a lot of feedback, especially grateful for firsthand comments of people who were at the events, plus Peter's music. And a big hit were the maps. And so the first question can go to Amanda and maybe also to, uh, to Jorge and Booster. Uh, first of all, there will be information on how to get the maps coming to you. And the two part questions that I see related to the maps are, can you say more about high school striking events? Because some said there were more high school events than colleges. And can you say more about other historically or majorly black colleges? Okay, I've got to un unmute you, uh, which means I've, there we go. Okay, Amanda, you're, you're live. Hi, yeah, I saw that in the chat. Um, the, a lot of the data that we got was based either from sort of major newspapers that are available online or those um, news bulletins. I'm sure that there were many um, high schools that were on strike that just didn't uh, call into the National Strike Information Center to um, report it. Uh, so if people know of um, other high schools that were on strike, uh, that would be, we love to add new data to that map. Um, I can send the email address for the project um, and people can send them in. Um, to the ones that are on the map are the ones that we found a definitive record of in our research. And, and then there isn't anything in the map uh, specific to historically black colleges and universities. Uh, when you look at the map in the description, sometimes there's um, indication if it's more uh, black students who are participating in the strike, um, but we don't have anything like on the map that's specific to that. Um, maybe someone who was of like a first hand witness can speak more to that. Who else, Terry, did you? Did, does Gail want to say more about historical black, black college activism uh, other than Jackson State, which was very significant? And if 
not, that's perfectly fine. Oh, I, I didn't hear your question. His question is whether you are, not, are aware of activities in other historically black colleges and universities, uh, anti-war activity. Again, Jackson State was not an anti-war event per se, but it was within that environment. So I don't know if you yes. know about any other schools. Tougaloo, Tougaloo College was certainly engaged at that time. Good. Okay, well, uh, Rested so, thanks. And take go ahead. Thank you, Galen. Since there are a lot of questions, I'll just keep going on. The next one may be directed to Frank, as you were talking about the broad anti-war movement, and it's a question about active duty service members. And the question also adds that this is the 50th anniversary of Operation Raw, Rapid American Withdrawal, in which vets crossed the New Jersey, New Jersey state to convene at Valley Forge with John Kerry and Jane Fonda. Do you have more to say about active duty service people who were against the war? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, they were a critical component of the anti-war movement uh, in many ways, both in the United States and for that matter in Vietnam itself. And of course, there was a lot of crossover between it's, it, in a way, it's an artificial distinction, but between the civilian uh, opposition to the war and resistance within the military, partly because some of the civilian resistance had to do with a vast anti-draft movement that involved draft counseling, draft resistance. I was a draft resistor myself. Um, and there was the coffee house movement uh, in which civilians, Jane uh, played a particular role in this, as did Holly Near and some others, in creating spaces where soldiers near military bases in the United States could go to talk about the war. Uh, so, and part of what's so remarkable about it, as I was trying to say, is it was so large and so multifaceted that uh, it, it is really, uh, instructive, I think, is the word that the Pentagon and their allies uh, have put so much effort into suppressing the history of the anti-war movement. The student aspect, the civilian aspect, the military aspect, the GI aspect, all of it. And that's why some of us are so proud to be able to uh, be having this conversation today. Okay. One, yes, one, you know, I remember quick that. Note on that, that, by the way, that I meant to say, John Kerry, of course, uh, achieved some of his prominence uh, uh, as an anti-war activist here in Detroit, Michigan, in the Winter Soldier uh, in the Winter Soldier hearings, which was another example of cooperation within the anti-war movement between civilians and, and military people. Jorge, did you want to add to that? Yes, yeah, you know, I, mean, I remember in 70, uh, there was a lot of the white students at Fairfax and Hollywood High School that went on, on strike uh, against the war. I went and spoke at their rallies. I was, I was, uh, I, I refused induction into the military that time. I went to the Bixel Center, which was the recruiting center for people to register for the draft. Uh, I went with my friends from high school, and I was there at the desk trying to convince them that the Armed Forces Office on Bixel, which was right out there, 15th and Santee at the time. Unfortunately, one of my childhood friends from, when I came from Mexico, a childhood friend, uh, George Martin, uh, he enlisted, and uh, I was able to convince him to go AWOL for six months until his mother pounded on him to go back. And he ended up uh, being deployed to Vietnam. And unfortunately, he died the first week he was there. And uh, unfortunate death of a good friend and many other people who did that, that, that occurred in that time. Well, Jorge, thank you very much for, for sharing that, for sure. 
Alan, this could be a question for you. And I was actually impressed that a couple of people asked it. It has to do with the National Guard units. And the question is, before they came to Kent State, were they already active at a strike, perhaps a trucker strike in which they were supporting scab labor? And can you say what your impressions are of whether the labor movement was positively or in what ways involved in the anti-war movement? Well, uh, my father was a 30-year activist in the UAW. He was the vice president of his local in Akron, Ohio. Um, at that time, the Teamsters were having a strike. It was kind of a wildcat strike, which they used to do a lot back in those days. It wasn't exactly an authorized strike. So the governor of Ohio, who called out the National Guard more often than all the other governors in the United States, called out the Guardsmen to uh, protect the bridges and to uh, protect the uh, truck drivers, some of whom were scabs, and they were driving on the highways. Some of them were getting shot at by the striking Wildcat uh, Teamsters, and they didn't return the fire. You know, they didn't shoot back against the Teamsters. But then the governor uh, got the call uh, to send the troops to Kent State after the uh, first night of uh, the protest in the streets in downtown Kent on Friday, May 1st. So Saturday, they were put on alert, and they came into Kent just while the ROTC building was on fire. Uh, the mayor of Kent uh, was hasty and called out the guards. So they were tired from being at that uh, trucker strike. Some people use that as an excuse. Uh, really, it's no excuse. Uh, they were there at Kent then for two days before they actually committed the massacre. Alan, thanks. Um, Here's one of the most specific questions that could be for anybody, but John and Brewster, you might want to start with your replies. I'm going to read it. It has been said that the national student strike was the zenith and largely the ending of mass agitation. With the repression of Kent State becoming clear, many student activists faded away, and the mass movement against the Vietnam War effectively ended when Nixon eliminated the military draft. What were the factors that kept the anti-war movement alive in the face of these factors? Um, Sir, do you want well, you know, uh, it's interesting. I mean, there are obviously demonstrations uh, up the wazoo after this. You had, you know, uh, the demonstration in April in 71. You had May Day in 71. You had other demonstrations that occurred. Uh, lo lots of action at the end, the counter inaugural against Nixon in January of, of 73. Um, just to mention a few, but I think at, le at least in my, what happened to me is I was sick of demonstrations, although I went to all of them, just about. Um, and so it was like, you know, how do you, how are you really making a difference, right? And, and so, uh, frankly, a lot of the students I was engaged with at Williams, we moved into the community. We left Williams, we moved into nearby communities and, and became community organizers. I was a VISTA volunteer for two and a half years. We set up a drug abuse counseling program, a 24-hour telephone counseling referral service, uh, a court referral program. We, we did, a, we ran a job release, an education release program with the local uh, minimum security prison, prison uh, camp uh, in Massachusetts there. Um, we organized in the religious community. We got involved in welfare rights organizing. We ran the McGovern campaign. My, my juvenile delinquents, so to speak, that were assigned to me every day, instead of going to the juvenile detention center, uh, eight hours a day, we're doing political work. I don't know how we got away with it. The, the, the night after, of the election, they uh, um, threw rocks through the Nixon headquarters in, in North Adams, Massachusetts. They totally freaked out. Uh, but at least they were engaged. But I guess all I'm saying is that, that a number of us felt like we needed to get into grassroots community organizing. Wade Rathke, who started Acorn, was a colleague of mine a couple of years ahead of me at Williams. He, he dropped out as well, and that's what he did. <laughs> you know? So, um, but then obviously the anti-war movement continued. Uh, I and many other people on this call, uh, I know, were involved in the Indo Indochina peace campaign. Uh, that, that Tom and Jane played a key role in and a number of other people on the call, as I said. And our job was to focus like a laser beam on um, mobilizing people in the closing period of the, of the war uh, to put political pressure on, on Nixon to stop the bombing initially and, um, and ultimately on <coughs> the administration um, to stop military, well, the Congress to stop aid to Indochina. Yeah. I think it's clear the campuses oh, as campuses became less of a focus uh, in, in large part, frankly, because of the end of the draft is the, 
uh, I think. And, and unfortunately, Nixon's Vietnamization campaign did affect some aspects of mass opposition to the war. It was no longer American bodies uh, on television every night. But as Brewster noted, I think 71 was the veterans march, the powerful march where they threw their medals back at the Capitol, um, again, closely linked to the civilian anti-war movement. I mean, there, uh, there was a, a things, especially after the Paris Peace Agreement, uh, the any sense of mass protest disappeared, but instead it became, and Brewster was a very important part of this, it became very focused, uh, not just the Indochina peace campaign, but the traditional peace groups, the Quakers at the American Friends Service Committee, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Mennonites, Church World Service, um, many, many different uh, liberal, progressive, uh, peace people. Often, in some ways, the people that had begun the peace movement uh, were there still at the end, as well as a lot of people that especially were mobilized through IPC who had developed their activism later on. But I mean, there, and remember, there had been the McGovern campaign and a lot of people involved with that, that uh, with the coalition to stop funding the war became probably the most powerful peace lobby in the history of the United States and actually brought about the uh, ending of U.S. aid to the South Vietnamese government, which is what led to their total demoralization since they knew they couldn't fight the war without the American military and financial backing. So, I mean, that it's, it's, uh, there are many aspects of the anti-war movement that are not very well known. And unfortunately, Ken Burns didn't help with that, but uh, the, certainly those last stages, that last stage focused on Congress built on all the other stages, so. John, if I could just add a quick point, I, picking up on that, I read an op-ed piece recently in the Washington Post just in the last week or so that sort of talked about what happened uh, at, at the end in Congress as though it had no connection whatsoever to the anti-war movement. Yeah. And it was like giving Congress credit for uh, ending the war. And it, these are some of the kinds of distortions that I think uh, programs like this help to deal with. I also get asked all the time about the assumption you can't have an anti-war movement unless you have a draft. Well, yes, you can. You know, we don't really have a volunteer army. We have a recruited army, and there are all kinds of ways to intervene in that process when the time comes to do that. So uh, I think that's one of the one of the other stereotypes about the the anti-war movement. Okay, thanks, John. It's uh, also, yeah. I'm just gonna say, perhaps there's time for two more. One will be quick and the other will allow a lot more conversation. Okay, but I wanna bring Peter back, so okay. quick. Quick, the one is, Gail, Gail there's many, there are many people who wanna know what the flag is behind you. <laughs> the flag behind me is my father's flag. We served in the army and uh, I put it on display. Well, I'm, I, that, that's perfectly a fit, fitting for this conversation. And so the last one, thank you, comes from our friend Rick, Rick Hind, which uh, I'm gonna read to all of you. And that is, which current US policies would benefit from the experience of the US peace movement during the Vietnam War? All of them. <laughs> My favorite would be Venezuela. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? <laughs> Anybody want a quick answer where you think the greatest impact of the anti-war movement experience should be? I think we need to be vigilant on the 
you, uh, you know, especially hopefully the last few months of Trump's administration intervening or starting a war or expanding the war in Vietnam, I mean, in the Middle East against Iran, I think that's a pretty uh, possibility and hopefully it will not happen. But recently he ordered the, the, the Navy to fire on any of the ships, uh, the naval ships of the uh, Iran army. So right. military. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the reason I mentioned Venezuela is they also have sent a flotilla of ships ostensibly to stop narcotics, but uh, that and the indictment of Maduro is painfully reminiscent of what was done in Panama. Uh, and laying the, I think that the COVID stuff may have totally undermined that momentum, although they may try and slip it by, but I think there's, there's some such deeper trouble in the country at this point that that uh, they're not likely to launch either in Iran or Venezuela. But I think you're right. We have to be very vigilant and ready to move. And, and we also have to remember that, that we moved very powerfully on Iraq. Um, I mean, there were mass demonstrations uh, and the war fortunately did not go on as long in Iraq, uh, but uh, I think that the opposition that was generated um, did reshape American opinion about that war, as well as, as in all wars, the total failure of it as an so, act of policy. So John, just let me say uh, thank yeah. you to everybody who- Let me who, point who out one question. significant thing. Uh, yeah, go sure. ahead, Jorge. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just a minute, Terry, go ahead, Jorge. Yeah, one significant thing. You know, Walter Ruther and the UAW were at the forefront of civil rights in the unions who took that type of position. But let me say that here in LA and Southern California, we have gotten a tremendous amount of unions to come on board uh, to commemorate the Chicano moratorium and also to speak up uh, and, and pull their support for being pro-peace, for culturally relevant education, and for expanding the safety net here in this country. And I think that's a significant move where we have the Teamsters, the United Teachers of LA, SEIU, uh, Justice for Janitors, uh, the Machinist Union, uh, moving together in our coalition which changes a lot of the, the makeup of our, our movement here with labor coming Great. in strong. Great. All right. Well, we're going to ask Peter to give us the wrap, both culturally and with his own wisdom about what we've all been talking about. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we will send out to everybody who registered links, including the details about all of the speakers and links to many videos and further things to read. Um, and we will send out an invitation to uh, more of a, a kind of classic uh, Zoom room where people can participate. And if the numbers are great, so great that it'll be too hard to have real conversation, then we'll break it in. They have a a room breakaway situation that we'll also make use of. Hey, John, can I make yeah. just one final quick point here? Sure. First, first of all, we, there were many more questions and they're still coming in and we would like to try and uh, do, answer those in, in another forum or even online. But the one that just last came in and thanks for all of them was, uh, people want to donate so that there could be more webinars. How can they do that? All right, there will, the information sheet that I put up and the follow-up message will have the, the link for our donor box. It's their tax deductible donations. And I would guess that to put, all, to put this on uh, has cost us a couple of thousand bucks, $2,500. So anybody who can help offset that, uh, we would be most grateful. So Peter, let me make sure you're unmuted. I am. And, uh, 
It's Frank. I have a family obligation. Yes. This was great. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Peter. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls have picked them everyone When will they ever learn? When Will they ever, when will we ever learn? So what we have to understand from my point of view, because all these other aspects of, as, as we've expanded the discussion to just what it is that we learned and just what it is that we shared in this anti-war movement as we spoke about resistance from within the army itself, within the Air Force, within the Navy. And we spoke about John Kerry and we spoke about, uh, you know, the throwing the medals back and the Vietnam veterans against the war. And we, and we know that there are people whose lives were decimated by being involved in this war. And more people committed suicide, I believe, or, or were died because of d uh, distress in their lives, then actually uh, were killed in combat. The devastation to the human beings in this society and the fragmentation of the society, which uh, today reflects the very fragmentation over the the war itself. That is. That is the legacy that we endure, but where is our strength and where, how do we get strength from what occurred in, 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 in the anti-war movement? We understand that as we, as we found in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, that ordinary people, not people who are elected, not people who are wealthy, not people who are in power, changed the course of history. That together we did alter Although racism is rampant and and furiously and just uh, uh, destructive to us in our present time, what we are understanding is that we have the capacity at the grassroots level. This was not a victory of power, money of any sort. It was a victory of the combination of the people bringing their hearts together. And that, uh, you know, we, we, we were a part of it. We remained together. It became the signal point for our lives. David Hawke and um, uh, uh, Sam Brown, or two leaders of the Moratorium. Lots of us remained, Margie Bank. And we, this was, these, these were our, our, our joyous moments of the best that we are when we gather together to to assert what was right and to oppose the madness and the uselessness of war. And if we cannot, cannot bring ourselves together, and that means overcoming the divisions that are being exacerbated and created and are artificial to a large degree, we will not be able to stand together. So our job now to create this movement is to bring our hearts together and music is one way we do it. So sing with me. Where have all the young girls gone? Long time passing. Where have all the young girls? Where have all the young girls gone? Long time. Where have all the young girls gone? They've gone for young men, everyone. Oh, when will we ever learn, my friends? When will we ever learn? Where have all the young men gone? They've gone to soldiers. 
Where have all the soldiers gone? Gone to graveyards and the graveyards. They've become flowers once again. And so the endless cycle continues. But we ourselves, we stopped a war. We created an entire change in the post-slavery policies and legacy and culture of America. We can do this, but we need to be within each other's hearts and not fooled into thinking that we have to, we can disagree, but not hate each other. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time. Long time, I want to see everybody's mouth say, long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time, long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago, long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? John, Terry, Terry Frank, Alan. Where have all the flowers gone? Young girls have picked them, everyone. My friends, we are still together. We must remember these lessons because it is these lessons that will carry us forward. Thank you, Peter. If I get this right, all right. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Tonight, um, Peter is doing every couple of nights a concert from his poem, which is totally informal and spontaneous. And uh, if you have it, it's done on YouTube. Um, if you can write down that address, I'll come back to it. But I also wanted to show these are the, uh, this is the information we'll send you, the Jackson State online program on the 14th. Kent State's was done on May 4th. The Chicano Moratorium website the information page that we've done, which gives you lots and lots of links to videos uh, and books and articles. Uh, of course, our donation option. Um, but again, if you want to join Peter later this evening. Uh, well, actually you could just go to Peter Yarrow YouTube and you will be directed there. You don't even okay. need this. You don't thing. need the full no, address. No, no. Okay, great. Well, they're wonderful. I mean, I've uh, have dipped in and out of them, and we've listed all of them uh, on our blog. But uh, it's in retrospect, it will have created a treasure of uh, Peter's insight into American folk music and both political and not so political. But it's uh, it's been really a treasure to to have there so thank you very much frank is gone now but i think everybody else is still on lindsay if you're still on thank you for your technical help um thank you for having and uh we will okay we will have if anybody wants to have any final comments please say them and and then uh, we will Say goodbye. Well, I just did want to, if you go to Peter Yarrow Facebook or Peter Yarrow YouTube, this has become a, we had a, the, the broadcast of the, of the, the Allie Lowenstein film uh, two nights ago with, um, uh, it, it was called Citizen. And, and we sing and we reminisce. And uh, it's like this, but it's saying we are here now and uh, this is wonderful, John. I want to thank you, as always. You are a hero to me for what you do. And to be in Vietnam with you. And yes, I do have that, that video that I will, I will show of, of John 
uh, of John, and uh, uh, we will continue. And let's keep doing this. This will strengthen us. People need this. We need it. We need to be together. What Peter's referring to is that three times he toured in Vietnam, north, south, center. This is, what, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, singing and trying to generate greater attention to the Agent Orange problem and raise funds for it. Um, uh, Peter doesn't stop. <laughs> he has, if you look at what he's doing now, you will discover that he was very deeply involved with the kids, uh, the families from the Connecticut shooting. He was very involved and created a whole music history for the kids in the Florida shooting. Um, and he's also done other work that's been to find ways that overcome the uh, tribalization in American society. Um, so, uh, as I say, he doesn't stop. <laughs> it's a, a model for all of us. So thank you very much. Uh, everybody is welcome to join the, I mean, this was a more conventional webinar, I think, it came out well. I am going to try and show the Holly part of uh, it could have been me because it does touch on both Jackson and Kent State. So give me a minute to pull that up. But uh, beyond that, I hope we'll all stay in touch. And thank you very much for participating. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. And we still have 100 people, so that's not too bad. <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can find this. Okay, this time I think I've done it. Hey John, the audio is not working. It's not. <sighs> um, uh, maybe try uh, stopping sharing, and then when you reshare, there's an option to uh, share your computer audio at the same time. Okay, let me. All right, I'll stop sharing and go back to it a minute and see. So now it's just got, it's, I have to. And then there should be a checkbox. Okay, let me go back to this. Um, go back into the. So we've learned something, but not everything about this system. Uh, okay. All right, Lindsay, where do I, what do I need to do? Uh, when you click share screen, yeah. the window pops up. There's a checkbox at the bottom of that window that says share computer audio. Okay, well then let me put Holly back to where she was. And I will... Try again. Ah, I see over at the left, the share computer sound. Okay. I think I learned that once and promptly forgot it. Um, and now I have to find out where that page is. Okay, move it. Okay. 
now. Let's see whether it's done. Um, is everybody seeing quickly, it now? This is all being Hearing it? sort of pacified and pushed yes, away. Yes. So you don't remember who your heroes and heroines are. Don't remember who the people who have struggled before you are. Um, the second verse is about Victor Hara, who's a Chilean songwriter and cultural worker who was killed by the junta at the time of the coup in Chile. And uh, people have already forgotten that there was a coup in Chile and that in fact things are as bad there as ever, that there are hundreds and hundreds of political prisoners and Chile is putting on a good face for you to make it look like they're making some humanitarian improvements but it's just a facade. Um, the third verse is about women who are struggling in national liberation fights all over the world, living in jungles, defending their dignity as well as their race and their nation. And um, the chorus is about us, so I hope you'll sing it. Well, Victor started singing until they shot his body down. You can kill that man, but not his song, because it sung the whole world round. And it could have been me, but instead it was you. So I'll keep doing the work you were doing as if I were two. I'll be a student of life, a singer of songs, a farmer of food, and the writer of wrong. It could have been me, but instead it was you. And it may be me, dear sisters and brothers, before we are through. Woman in the jungle, so many wars away. Studies late into the night, defends a village in the day. Although her skin is golden, like mine will never be. Her song is heard, and I know the words, and I'll sing them till she's free. It could have been me, but instead it was you. If I were to, I'll be a student of life, a singer of songs, a farmer of food, and the writer of wrong. Oh, it could have been me, but instead it was you. And it may be we, dear sisters and brothers, before we are through. We can do. Thanks for singing with us. So that was Holly with Jeff Langley playing uh, in 1976 at the University of Pittsburgh. And it's the own, uh, she's continued to vary the song. This is the version that I could find that actually included Jackson State as well as Kent State. So any rate, thank you again, everybody. Um, and uh, let's see what we, how, I, oh, I know I have to stop share to get that off of the page. That's all. Okay. So we have lost several people. Uh, we still have 70 <laughs> participants. So thank you for sticking with us. Hope you enjoyed Holly's song and we will hopefully stay in touch. And thank you, Amanda, for creating the vehicle for uh, having people understand the larger strike and the, what created the events. 
And uh, Lupe, you're still on. I, I see the still picture, so I don't know if you're still on, but thank you. And we hope to hear more about August. Um, so thank you to everybody. This will all be available online and I'll send that around. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, John. Bye. Good job, John. Thanks, man. Yep, sure. Way to go, Amanda.